Okay, so what I want to talk about is, you know, as a, as a clinician, uh, when I see a patient uh, for evaluation, you know, it's my job to figure out, hopefully within that hour, some, sometimes I'm not so fortunate, sometimes you have, to, you have to kind of do it in a stepwise fashion, but I should be able to, just simply based upon history and physical examination, I should be able to figure out if the patient has Park Parkinson's disease or not Parkinson's disease. And in the, in the not Parkinson's disease category, certainly multiple systems atrophy. There are some others that we call atypical Parkinson-isms. The ism is kind of the key thing. Uh, but we're going to focus today on, on uh, the two types of, of uh, multiple systems atrophy, starting with uh, the cerebellar type. Um, uh, Tom reviewed, reviewed this nicely. I'm going to probably repeat some things that he's already said. But, you know, back in the old days, and I actually kind of like the old uh, uh, terminology. Uh, in the old days, we would call MSAC, we'd call that olivoponto cerebellar atrophy, or OPCA. And basically, it's cerebellar Parkinsonism with dysautonomia. The second category, and, and, and uh, uh, th this categorization, or this terminology, is, is relatively new, the MSAC and MSAP. Oppenheimer came up with that in the, I think, 69, 70s, kind of in that range. Try, trying to kind of consolidate things so that we weren't using these multisyllabic terms, but uh, MSAC would be olive OPCA. MSAP is, uh, the, the, the old term is striatonigral degeneration. Again, kind of a mouthful, so it's easier to say MSAP. But this would be uh, uh, Parkinsonism with dysautonomia and typically no tremor. Now, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's disease, I'll just go over them real quick. There are four diagnostic criteria. One of them is resting tremor. That would be a tremor when you're not doing anything, the hand shakes. So if you're sitting and you, and, and, and bear it, and this is going to be important when I get to uh, talking about the diagnostic criteria for MSAs. Parkinson's disease, standard issue Parkinson's, always begins on one side. And that side is always going to be the worst of, it. now Parkinson's becomes a bilateral uh, condition, but it always begins on one side. It's asymmetric, and uh, uh, that's an important key. Um, but th the four criteria for Parkinson's, resting tremor typically, it, it, and it, it doesn't necessarily hit the right side or the left side. It, it's not necessarily if you're right-handed or left-handed, but resting tremor. The second piece is a particular or a peculiar type of stiffness in the muscles called cogwheel rigidity, and I can feel that. It's something that I can, on examination, by simply moving the joints, I can actually appreciate that, and I can, I can feel this stiffness, cogwheel rigidity. It's like ratchets in a gear. So resting tremor, cogwheel rigidity. The third of the four is called bradykinesia, or slowness of movement, and this can manifest a, in, in a number of different ways. Uh, Parkinson patients, when they're sitting, you, you know, when we're sitting, we fidget and we kind of move around and kind of squirm in our seats and so forth. Parkinson patients don't. They just, they're there. And there's very little in the way of spontaneous movements. We, so we call that generalized bradykinesia, slowness of movement. But also it translates to impairment of, bradykinesia translates to impairment of fine motor skills. And we test that. Actually, we use something called the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. And there are several items testing for fine motor. And it's quite, I mean, it, it's so low tech. It's so old school. But simply finger tapping, hand opening, closing, pronation, supination, repetitive heel and toe tapping. And a Parkinson patient, instead of doing this, it gets smaller, slower, and eventually it'll break down and stop larger hand opening closing it just gets more it gets more jittery almost and then the same with with these other movements so we got resting tremor cogwheel rigidity bradykinesia and the fourth component is trouble with balance and walking or shuffling and you can sort of remember the main par features of parkinson's disease as shaky stiff slow and shuffly all that the four s's well we're going to see how these atypical Parkinsonian conditions, the uh, uh, multiple systems atrophies, differ. And I want you to just remember that Parkinson's always begins on one side. Okay, when we talk about, uh, uh, talk about MSA-C, the cerebellar uh, form, 
And Dr. Chalemsky talked about uh, the, the cerebellum as kind of matching your environment to your movements. So that when you reach for something, for example, the cerebellum is telling your arm and hand where to start and stop. Parkin uh, patients who have cerebellar disorders, that start, stop, and, and accuracy modality is defective. So what we see, and uh, I hope you can, can see that, it, ataxia means loss of balance. And basically, gait ataxia, in, in, in a word, is drunk walking. And the reason that drunks walk like this is because alcohol is a cerebellar toxin. It's a cerebellar suppressant. So the reason that they get slurry speech and, walk, and can't walk you know, when the cop pulls them over, uh, the reason they can't do those things is because their cerebellum is being uh, suppressed. So loss of balance, unsteady gait, incoordination, clumsiness, falling, dizziness, walk like I'm drunk. So those would be common, common uh, descriptors of what is ataxia. Unfortunately, what isn't ataxia? It's the exact same list. You can get <laughs> multiple, I mean, you, know, you know, you can have loss of balance, unsteady gait, incoordination, clumsiness, dizziness, and falling, uh, and not necessarily have cerebellar ataxia or cerebellar uh, insufficiency. And I'm gonna show you, this is kind of a fun video. Um, this, this gal, this is about, from about two years ago. She hit uh, the airwaves in a big way, uh, claiming that she had developed a gait disorder because of getting uh, a vaccination for the, a flu shot, basically. And so she was uh, out to uh, sue the, the drug company. <clears throat> and, the, and the media bought into this 100%. Twisting, jerky movements. But she walks backwards normally. Doctors say she has a rare one in a million neurological disorder that was triggered 10 days after she got a seasonal flu shot. Okay, so I'm gonna cut to the chase here. Uh, this is fake. This is, this is entirely fake. Uh, it was discovered that she had actually done an internet search on, um, on you know, movement disorders and she was miraculously cured by, it was like some quack with some quacky treat, I forget that, what the heck it was, but it was clear that she was out to sue somebody. And that was a totally fake ataxia. So you, you writhing around and, and then you know, there are other reasons to have trouble with your balance and walking that aren't neurologic necessarily. You know, if you got bad hips or you got a bad low back, you know, your gait may not be entirely normal. Spine, deconditioning, and, and let's face it, the older we are, just as a part of normal aging phenomena, uh, you know, gait and balance can be affected. There's a test that neurologists love to do called a tandem gait, which is the walking with one foot right in front of the other. It's useless in an elderly person, in my humble opinion, Dr. Chalimsky. <laughs> I, 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 don't ask, I don't ask my elderly to, to do that little test because it really doesn't, doesn't mean a lot. <clears throat> okay, and there are, other, there, there are other neurologic disorders besides cerebellar degeneration uh, or cerebellar ataxia. There's something called lower half Parkinsonism, for example, which is uh, thought to largely be due to what is essentially hardening of the arteries or vascular Parkinsonism. Uh, there's something called gait apraxia, which is different than ataxia. Uh, and then we have all these other uh, descriptors. Uh, scissor gait, antalgic gait, festinating gait, pigeon gait, I love that one, propulsive gait, steppage gait, stomping gait. I mean, so there's a, uh, uh, and I made, I made up this term here, tippy toe gait. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes you'll have patients that, that get up on their tiptoes. And you can see that a lot even in cerebral palsy and other things, but that's not really ataxia. Um, Okay, and then there, there's, a there's a type of ataxia which is due to peripheral neuropathy. If, if your brain doesn't receive the signals from your feet, so for example in bad diabetic neuropathy, they may not know where their feet are going because simply the nerves distally are not, you know, they're not working properly so they really don't know where their feet are. We call that sensory ataxia. And there are other things, vitamin B12 deficiency, uh, other things, if, if you're low on vitamin E, so my job as a neurologist when the patient comes in is I need to, to make sure that everything that can be looked at has been looked at. There are treatable forms of ataxia. 
and there are untreatable forms. And unfortunately, we don't have any medications to help cerebellar disorders, really. I, you know, if we could come up with something, we'd be, be billionaires. Vestibulopathy refers to inner ear. So if you have a bad inner ear, you're going to be unsteady. So, so once again, uh, the clinical features of cerebellar, since MSA-C, the C is cerebellar, so what are the clinical features of, of, of that? I, I, we talked about the, the ataxia. Uh, broad base means that it, to compensate for being unsteady, individuals with ataxia oftentimes will walk with their feet kind of wider apart, and we call that a broad base. It's a compensatory strategy. It makes perfect sense. In addition, there's something called dysmetria. Uh, this would be a type of, of uh, incoordination that in the office we test it by, I have a patient hold their hands out front, and then they touch, touch their nose, bring it out, touch my finger. And I, and I may move my finger to different spots. And what happens with dysmetria is, instead of a smooth back and forth, you get, you get this. And typically, it's an, it, and refer to it as an endpoint or intention tremor. OK, so the way dysmetria manifests itself uh, in everyday life is eating and drinking. I mean, so if you've got somebody who does this, or trying to get the spoon to the mouth, and you get this going, then obviously, that's a big problem. And that's a cerebellar disorder. In a, it, we use a term, it's a terrible term, dysdiadocokinesis. God only knows why they came up with that word. But, but basically, it's alternating movements that we can test like this. OK, do this, do this, do this. Patients with cerebellar disorders, it becomes incoordinated, kind of slappy, kind of, it's inaccurate. It's sloppy. It's kind of a sloppy, instead of a crisp, you know, this kind of a thing. Uh, dysarthry refers to the slurring of the speech that we see with cerebellar disorders. And then there are eye findings that, uh, you, you know, when the cop pulls, well, not from personal experience, but, <laughs> but you know, one of the things that they'll do is they'll say, okay, follow my finger, follow my finger. And what they're looking for is a phenomenon called nystagmus. So the eyes, uh, instead of going smoothly one side to the other, at the end of a movement, you see these little tiny jerks, and that's called nystagmus. And that's a cerebellar thing. And again, alcohol is a cerebellar toxin. So that's, that's a very sensitive finding, nystagmus, for cerebellar disorders. Uh, we, can, we can actually assign, based on the anatomy of the cerebellum, different, different clinical features. The cerebellum is made up of two outer lobes, or hemispheres. And then the midline structure that kind of joins them together is called the vermis. So when we get vermian or vermis involvement, that affects your midline uh, while walking in balance, chiefly. Uh, and that's why, a actually, long-term alcohol toxicity affects the vermis. And that's why alcoholics with uh, cerebellar dis uh, degeneration, you know, they, they have disordered stance and gait, truncal instability. I mean, when it's, when it's bad, these folks can't even sit up straight without, uh, without uh, kind of wobbling. And that we refer to that as titubation, which is kind of a wobbly tremor. Uh, ocular motility disturbances, it's dysarthry. The hemispheric involvement is, is appendicular, and by that I mean arms, hands, arms, legs, and feet. Okay, so my job is to make sure it's, so, it's not something else. So you're going to get an MRI scan. You're going to get, because uh, we want to rule out some of, these, some of these other conditions that can mimic it. You're going to get blood work, because uh, we want to make sure there's nothing there that we can fix. As I said, vi certain vitamin deficiencies and other things, immun immunologic disorders. What I want you to look at is what I'm doing here is sort of the analogous thing to finger to nose, and I call it toe to finger. See how her foot wiggles as she gets, it's just not accurate. It's not a smooth boom, boom, boom. And so uh, what I want, to, want you to watch with her gait, her feet are a little wider apart. This is not terrible uh, uh, ataxia. But nevertheless, she's got a widened base. Watch when she turns. She kind of stumbles a little bit. So this is mild or early cerebellar ataxia. And this is this, that thing I just mentioned that I never test in older folks. This is called tandem gait. And she completely can't do it without falling off to one side or the other. So she clearly has cerebellar ataxia. Um, now, what I, well, you're not going to be able to see that, darn it. Basically, uh, these are two, sh two shots, two MRI scans on that, on that gal. But OK, so as Dr. Chalemsky said earlier, this, this would be the patient is facing this direction. And we're, we're, we're cutting right down the middle with the MRI scan. So uh, here's the nose, and 
here's the chin. This is the cortex, which is unaffected in, in MSAs, but, and it's hard to make out here, but this is the area called the cerebellum, and it ought to be full, but I, I can see that there's a lot of dark in here, and the dark is space, and the space indicates that the cerebellar tissue has shrunken, or there's cerebellar atrophy, and you can see it also. This is the same patient, just a little bit different cut. It almost, it almost makes the cerebellum look like a, a, a frond of broccoli. Uh, it, it ought to be full, and it isn't. It's, it's showing signs of some shrinkage. So um, that, that gal, the video, little video clip I showed you, she did have some facial masking, so some mild Parkinsonian features. She clearly had cerebellar involvement, and she did have autonomic testing, which was abnormal. This is just another shot. So, uh, you know, brain, patient facing that way, brain stem, and you can see in the cerebellum that there's a lot of dark, and the dark is space, which represents atrophy. It ought to be full of cerebellum, and it's not. The other thing I would point out is this. This area of the brain from here down, down to here, is your, your brain stem, and it's got multiple, multiple components. There's the, the upper part is called the midbrain. Uh, the lower part is called the medulla, and then the middle part is called the pons, and this pons is not full. It should be, it should be rounded, and it's flattened right there. So going back to the old term of olivo-ponto cerebellar atrophy, the pons is the ponto part, and the pons in this case is flattened, and there's significant cerebellar atrophy. And again, we always do lots of tests just to make sure it's not something else. I want to talk a little bit now about MSA-P, the Parkinsonian uh, form. Um, and I, I'm going to first show you this clip. OK, this is a, a lady in her 30s. And actually, her story is that she was sent down to, to see me for consideration of deep brain stimulation. The reason being that her doctor had tried every part, because she's even just the still shot here, she's very Parkinsonian in appearance. Complete loss of spontaneous facial expression, reduced blink rate, Parkinson patients look like they're staring. Uh, her voice was very soft and breathy, and I'll show you some other things that look very, very Parkinsonian. But her doctor had tried all the usual, all the usual meds and nothing worked. So, you know, the light bulb went off in his head, well, the meds didn't work, maybe surgery will. And so my task was to see if she'd be a good surgical candidate. And she is not a good surgical candidate for, OK. OK, you can see, uh, again, complete loss of spontaneous facial expression, almost complete loss of eye blinking. There's an eye blink. Her mouth is kind of hanging open. You can't hear it, but her voice is breathy. And, she, and again, normally when people sit in a chair, they twitch and wiggle and you know, fidget and so forth. There's absolutely no spontaneous movements in her case. She's just there. And in a minute, we're going to see her, her walk. And I would have you pay attention to the fact that she is totally symmetric. Remember I said Parkinson's is asymmetric? She's t her involvement is completely symmetric. And she indeed does have a couple of things that make it different than Parkinson's. Uh, you'll notice that she doesn't have any resting tremor. MSAP patients don't typically have a resting tremor. Now, Patients with Parkinson's don't always have a resting tremor, but when you see it, it kind of nails it. But you can see when she walks, she has no arm swing on either side. Uh, she has reduced step height and stride length. And just a generalized slowness. Every movement is viscous and slow and laborious. Well, I actually kept her, one of, one of the real critical uh, ways that we can delineate if a person has regular Parkinson's versus not regular Parkinson's and perhaps MSAP is levodopa responsiveness. Levodopa is a medication. It's been around for a long time. It's the best treatment for Parkinson's, by the way. Uh, but uh, we'll do an L-dopa challenge. And I actually kept her in my office all day, and I fed her levo carbidopa levodopa over a period of, of all day. And I actually got her up to a, a, a very high dose without any response whatsoever. Lack of levodopa responsiveness is one additional key uh, finding in the MSA-P category. I always try Parkinson medications, because that's what really all we've got. But 
I always tell the patients that odds are this is not going to work. You know, just kind of prepare them. But, but you know, you don't want to completely take away. Because on occasion, you'll have somebody who does get a little bit of a response. It's not usual, though. And in her case, uh, high-dose levodopa d did absolutely nothing. So she, was not, she would not be a candidate for deep brain stimulation. So the clinical features, marked loss of spontaneous facial expression, vocal hypophonia, which means softness or breathiness, uh, generalized rigidity and bradykinesia, stiffness and slowness of movement, no tremor, loss of arm swing, symmetric, slow shuffling gait, uh, symmetric onset, note that Parkinson's is always asymmetric, poor response to levodopa and other dopaminergics, meaning other dopamine, bo we have other dopamine boosting medications. And the dysautonomia in MSA-P is much more prominent than it is in Parkinson's. Parkinson's patients do get dis some dysautonomia, but it's typically not as early or as severe as patients with the multiple systems atrophy spectrum. <coughs> There is a very specific pathology to MSA, as there is in Parkinson's, and they're completely different. In Parkinson's disease, when you t look at a Parkinson brain under the microscope, you see little tiny microscopic pink round, th round things or spheres that we call Lewy bodies, L-E-W-Y. Lewy bodies are the hallmark of Parkinson's disease and of a couple of other things. Lewy bodies are not seen in MSA. What we see are GCIs or glial cytoplasmic inclusions. Uh, glial cytoplasmic inclusions look like this. And the arrows point to, it's those brownish spots. Those brown spots are made up of an abnormal protein called alpha-synuclein. Alpha-synuclein, we all have, actually, it's a normal protein in our brain. It's a norm However, in these disorders, it's misfolded. It's not in the right configuration. And in, in Parkinson's disease, which is also an alpha-synuclein problem, or we say alpha-synucleinopathy, Parkinson's is an alpha-synucleinopathy. MSA is an alpha-synucleinopathy. In Parkinson's, the, the synuclein is in the Lewy bodies. In MSA, the alpha-synucleinopathy is in the glial cells, or the, as I said, glial cytoplasmic inclusions. And one of the interesting things that's, that's, I think, relatively recent on the horizon is the fact that they have been able to take Lewy bodies, for example, which are full of alpha-synuclein, inject it into a normal, healthy animal, and the Lewy bodies appear to have the capability of convincing normal neighborhood, neighboring cells to develop abnormalities. So it raises the possibility, are, the, are these disorders, these, these synuclein disorders, in any way kind of like infectious? Are these infectious processes? Because if you take that alpha-synuclein laden cell and put it into a normal brain, the normal brain starts to develop alpha-synucleinopathy. So, and that shouldn't be because there's no DNA in alpha-synuclein. There's no RNA. These are the messengers, you know, for our genetic code. I mean, normally if you get infected, it's because of the DNA and the RNA contained in the virus or the bacterium or what have you. These disorders do not have any DNA or RNA in them. They're just abnormal proteins, but they appear to have the capability of talking neighborhood proteins into being abnormal. And there is a disorder uh, which we know uh, a, a fair amount about that causes a very similar phenomenon called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. This is a deadly disorder. It's similar to chronic wasting disease uh, of uh, deer, different, different encephalopathies, where you have a protein actually be acting like an infectious agent. In Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, it's called prion, P-R-I-O-N disease. It's an abnormal protein. Again, uh, these are very, very, I think, fascinating and relatively new developments on the horizon. So, uh, you know, stay tuned for that. And I think that's all I got. Is that good? Thank you.